Hi, I'm Nicholas Lodge, so head on over to YouTube and subscribe to Kaker's Chat. Welcome to the SoFlo Cake and Candy Expo 2018. Let's get inside. Welcome cakers, bakers, and sweet treat makers. This is Kaker's Chat. In this episode, we chat with global sugar master, Chef Nicholas Lodge, who needs no introduction. I like to describe Chef Lodge's career like a beautiful bouquet of flowers, each petal representing another amazing opportunity, such as being on a team of decorators for the royal family, the White House, and many celebrities. He has been sharing his knowledge and skills through classes, books, and DVDs for nearly 40 years. Nicholas, along with his partner Scott, founded the International Sugar Art Collection and the International School of Sugar and Confectionery Arts. At the school, he teaches all levels and aspects of sugar art and cake decorating in Atlanta, Georgia. He also has a sister school in Tokyo, Japan. Nicholas is now involved in judging events and passing down that torch to a younger generation of sugar artists. Now let's get to know Chef Nicholas Lodge and how he cultivated a career in a sugar garden. So let's talk about how meticulous you are. You create these beautiful uh, botanically correct petals and flowers down to the shading and how thin the wires and honestly I watch your tutorials just for soothing meditation because otherwise I can't recreate what you're doing. <laughs> how did you get into this whole botanical world? I'm actually a trained florist so when I lived in England I used to have a dried flower business and a flower business and I love working with fresh flowers and doing fresh flower arrangements which helps me a lot. So I've always knew my, my dad growing up, how we had a beautiful garden where I grew up in England. And so I would always really enjoy looking at flowers. So I think I've always had a sort of a, a love of flowers from an early age. So I sort of like look at them and sort of, you know, try to, because as I tell my students, you can't make a flower from, from memory. You know, again, now we've spoken about using the internet, but you know, putting on Google, a, you know, search for a particular flower you have to make and you're gonna get lots of you know, beautiful images of that. Earlier before the internet, I used to use seed catalogs, you know, so I would order like seed and bulb catalogs because they have really nice photographs and they're usually free, you know, whereas you could go and spend a lot of money on a book right. and it's really going to have the same photographs in it. But um, so, you know, researching what the flower actually looks like is really important because how can you make something that looks sort of realistic if you don't really, if you don't understand how many petals it has or the construction of the flower. And, you know, it, it's been a 40 year, basically, I mean, professionally, I've been in this industry for 40 years. And, uh, but I've actually made, you know, about approximately about 430 flower, different sugar flowers, I think was at the last count. Um, some of those flowers I've only ever made once because they drove me crazy and I never want to make them again. You know? Is that true? Which flower was that? Which, which flower drove Nicholas Lodge? This is going to be like a quiz that we're going to do. Like, <laughs> which flower drove Nicholas Lodge so crazy that he was never to create it again? Well, actually, passion flower was pretty time consuming, but when I have a school in Japan, and so I did a sweet chestnut, so chestnut, which looks a bit like a sea urchin. So my students said, oh, chef, we wanted to, we want to make, you know, chestnuts. So I did the chestnut out of the shell, and then it looks like a green sea urchin. And um, it's what we use for roasted chestnuts, you know, it's the edible chestnuts. Um, but it has basically about 450 like little needles. So taking like little tiny pinhead sized pieces of gum paste and making like 450 of these needles and then covering uh, you know, the shape of the chestnut with green paste and trying to stick those all in. It was, you know, it took about 10 hours to make one chestnut. And, uh, but Japanese love that. They're very detail orientated. Whereas, you know, in the US, I mean, when you think about it, if you were selling that, you'd have to be selling that for several hundred dollars for that right. one chestnut. So. For one chestnut. Yes, yeah. But uh, so there are some things that, you know, I've made or, or things that, that I've made and then realized that just doesn't look good in sugar. You know, like for example, carnations, you know, like large carnations, you know, when you go and buy a bunch of flowers in the grocery store, supermarket, the sort of the, that often use the boutonnieres, made, those made in sugar look very heavy. Um, so whereas carnations are typically made little small spray ones, like you get in little small sprays. But, but so some, some flowers like lend themselves to sugar and other flowers, you know, just sort of don't, you know. And I'm always trying to, you know, when I did my 
example, at my craftsy class on you know modern sugar flowers, so bringing out you know succulents started to become popular. So really, I was the first person to start making succulents in sugar, and now you're going to see a lot of like gum paste succulents and people doing them in buttercream and things like that. So so I follow trends, and you know, so my whole makeup of like interior design and fashion. I mean, I read bridal magazines. I read, so I'm I'm up on new trends in color. Pantone colors of the year, you know what the modern trend flowers are for this season. So those are all things that really help help me as an instructor, and also sort of being able to then create that flower and then sort of be ahead and offer that the next year for a class. So. Yeah, you actually really sound like you know what you're talking about when it comes to these flowers. It seems like you've had a little bit of practice. Hold on to your spatulas. It's time for the quick mix Q and A. Your favorite color? Actually, orange, surprisingly. Green is my brand color, but orange is my favorite color. Favorite song? Uh, like a Prayer by Madonna. Name your favorite season? Um, probably spring, I would say. What's your favorite dessert? Banana pudding. What's your least favorite dessert? Anything chocolate. <laughs> Early bird or night owl? Um, both. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Tea, of course. I'm British, so. And your zodiac sign is Gemini. Name a cake tool you just can't live without. Oh, probably about a hundred of them. <laughs> exactly. How did you get into caking? Um, my mom was a great cook and a baker, so it was just as a child helping my mom in the kitchen, like many people that start in cake decorating, through grandparents and mothers. If you weren't a caker, what would you be? Um, probably a floral designer or an interior designer, so, which is two of my other loves. So, what did your first cake look like? Horrendous. <laughs> Ten years old, mother's and father's anniversary. Gloppy buttercream. Um, attempted to make some little roses and carnations on the top. It was a train wreck, but I was very pleased with it. So, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, my legacy would be um, that I've helped people over the years of 40 years in the industry, you know, hopefully through my books and education, being able to pass things on to people to make life easier for them. So you've been in the industry for a while. How do you stay fresh? How, how is Nicholas Lodge still somebody you want to get your hands on, somebody you still want to learn from? So if you're a teacher and you feel like maybe your classes aren't selling as much, what do you recommend they do? Well, I think, you know, sadly, in our industry, like in any other industry, you can't be complacent. You know, you can't basically just teach the same thing over and over at every single show. Typically, you know, I'll teach a class two or three times and then I retire it, you know, and then I'll move on to something else. So I come up with like a cake project or a flower project like, you know, I did a Asian inspired sugar flowers where I made lotus and bamboo and sort of Asian flowers in Austin. And I'm teaching that one more time in the fall and then that basically will be retired. Um, so a little bit like, I mean, I consider a little bit similar to like, say, a musician, somebody like Elton John, Madonna, Cher, you know, we've all been around a long time. Elton John lives in Atlanta, so we're both natives to Georgia um, now. And but so, you know, like somebody like Elton John has to reinvent himself all the time. I mean, coming up with new, not necessarily new music, like I'm still using the same gum paste, but it's just the way I use it, the colors you know, working on what the trend color is this year. So maybe a flower that I haven't made for a few years. You know, the Pantone color this year is basically ultraviolet. It's a purple violet color. So then maybe making a flower like a Dahlia in that color rather than in say yellow, which I've done in the fall, makes it fresh. It makes it sort of, so you know, it's, it, you're, re, you're basically repurposing, just like fashion, everything goes around in circles. And I think you have to sort of like, but as I said, sadly, I think a lot of instructors become complacent in what they teach. And then they, you know, they teach the same thing, you know, dozens of times. And of course, it's going to get to a point where everybody's seen it. And then sadly, what happens is the students who go and take the class, then they maybe go and teach it or put it on YouTube. So then it becomes everybody's seen how to do it. So then why would you go and take a class on that? So, you know, you have, I mean, to basically to be successful in this industry, you have to put in a lot of time and effort. It doesn't, it's not an easy industry, you know. Um, I mean, especially now, there are many, many teachers now. Um, it's not as easy as it used to be. And of course, now we have the 
situation of like social media, I mean, which is great, but um, also now pretty much on YouTube, you can find anything you want to learn in cake decorating, any technique you can find on YouTube. And I'm not knocking that, but it's just that, you know, sadly there is a lot of people that put information out there, which is not technical and not correct. And, you know, they can't make something work. And so I really don't understand why they would put it out for the whole world to see. But, but there are also some excellent tutorials on YouTube. And there are people that, that obviously, you know, offer those free. But I always tell my students, you know, make sure you watch two or three versions of the same technique or the same flower because you're going to pick up just like going and taking a class, a hands-on class. But ultimately, I don't think there's anything like a hands-on experience. And, and luckily, I think that is coming back a little bit because I think people realize that First of all, you know, when you watch something at home on your TV or your computer, you know, you're not in a classroom with like, say, 11 other ladies or men and right. ladies. So I think that whole sort of experience of a hands-on experience where you can chat and laugh and talk about your family and get to know people, make friends, I mean, um, see other people's photographs of their cakes. and. So to me, it's a very social thing taking a class. And I think sadly, like now, a lot of people become like hermits in their home and they don't really sort of like get out there and sort of go to cake shows and they don't compete and they don't go to hands-on classes. And, you know, sadly, it's sort of that's the only way you're really going to learn. And you can only learn so much on an online or on a computer because, you know, when I'm teaching, say, a piping class, I can physically hold the student's hand and say, no, you're slightly at the wrong angle. You're never going to learn that, you know, watching it on a computer because you just that could be little things that you struggle with for years. Yep. And even in a competition, you do that on a cake. And I would say as a judge, you know, your angle of your tip is incorrect or your consistency of your royal icing is incorrect because that person maybe found that recipe on the Internet and they thought, well, that's the recipe for royal icing, but it could be way, way too soft. So they pipe their flour, you know, they pipe their shell border and it's obviously not holding its shape. So it's a lot of little things, but it's uh, but as I said, you know, it's always having to, to sort of be, be sort of forward thinking and as I said, keeping ahead of trends and colors and what's hot in flowers or in cake or whatever. And so of course, a lot of incredible artists do that in different ways. You know. I think it's fantastic that you brought up the, the hands-on experience because of this major aspect. In our industry, it is the small things that actually count because that little gesture or degree of how you're holding either the piping bag or whatever you're doing or how you, you might be rolling your fondant like it's pizza dough or something like that. You're not, you're not supposed to roll it back and forth or something like that. Why is it sticking to my rolling pin? It's because you're self-taught or you're going to University of YouTube, which, like you said, is a great resource if you're watching the right video because you could be watching the video that's teaching you the wrong way so all you're doing is learning the wrong way but i mean it's a good point about rolling out because you know having grown up in europe and i mean obviously my mom made everything from scratch you know so i mean at four years old i would help my mom roll out pastry when i moved to the u.s when i moved to atlanta atlanta's been my home for 27 years now but, you know, when I first started teaching in the U.S. about 35 years ago, I mean, I was shocked that people didn't know what, how to roll out things because people buy frozen pie crust and they, most people don't own a rolling pin. So, you know, it's like it's things I grew up with and just was second nature. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an art, like rolling out fond and correctly. You know, you have to put weight behind your rolling pin. And so those are things you sometimes take for granted, but realize that sometimes because of cultures or how somebody's brought up, they never maybe never made a pie crust. They never rolled out pastry. So they don't really understand. Their mom hasn't shown them. The mom hasn't been there or the grandmother to show them the technique. So a lot of times I have students and they just, you know, they do this with a fondant and they're trying to sort of roll it out and then it's sticking to the table because they're not turning the fondant. Chef Nicholas Lodge, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Promise that you'll be back because you're a plethora of information. Hey, hope you've enjoyed this episode of Caker's Chat. If you have a question or two, don't let it stew. Comment below and let us know. Hey, and give us a hug with a thumbs up and a subscribe. Catch you on the next episode of Caker's Chat. Hi, I'm Ashley.
I'm Melanie. And I'm Natasha. And, and we're the hosts of SoFlo Cake and Candy Expo. The 2018 show was amazing. So grab your aprons, because 2019 is going to be fantastic. Head over to SoFloCakeAndCandyExpo.com to sign up for our newsletter. And be the first to know about our classes and swag. And don't forget about all of our special guests. So grab your coffee and join me. And me. For Cakers Chat at SoFlo. Did you know Melanie and Natasha are offering you a special savings? That's right. Cakers Chat subscribers get 15% off general admission. That's C-A-K-E-R-S. Tickets are on sale now. See you there.